Today we're going to take a look at a Linux distro that a lot of people seem to sleep on. Not too many people talk about it, yet this distro gave birth, if you will, to other more popular distros like Ubuntu, PureOS, and Kali Linux, just to name a few. The distro I'm talking about is, of course, Debian, and the latest version of it is currently 10.4, codenamed Buster. Debian is also one of the most stable Linux distros. It's about as stable as most tin isotopes. So if you don't need to be on the bleeding edge and you don't somehow enjoy fixing broken Linux systems, then Debian might be a good pick for you. You can download it from this URL right here on the Debian website. This is going to give you the option to install Debian via the internet. And basically the way that this ISO here works, oh, and of course you're gonna want the AMD 64. Uh, if you're on any of these other architectures, then I expect you to kind of know what you're doing. And with this type of ISO, it's a much smaller file size. Um, like you can see that it's only 336 megs, but it downloads most of the packages over the internet. It also gives you the option of setting up which desktop environment that you want to use. Uh, so that's definitely a plus in my book. Um, if you don't have internet, then you obviously won't want to do this. You'll want to use a different type of Debian ISO. Now I'm going to be setting up Debian in a virtual machine but the installation process for hardware is essentially the same. You just have to first flash the ISO to a flash drive and select it as your first boot option in your BIOS. So let's start configuring our virtual machine. I'm gonna call it Debian Stable. And of course, Debian is one of the Linux distributions that VirtualBox is able to automatically identify. Let's give it about four megs, I mean four gigs rather, of RAM. And yep, that seems like a good installation path. Let's give it about 30 gigs of storage size. You don't actually have to give it this much, but I'm just gonna give it for the purpose of this video. And I'm gonna do a fixed size so that it's a little bit faster. All right, so we got that created and I'm just gonna change a couple other things real quick. So I'm going to do two CPU threads. I'm going to do, uh, we're on the display, crank up the video memory, and let's also change the graphics controller to VBOX VGA. And last but not least, let's add our ISO, Debian 10. All right, there we go. So now let's start this bad boy up. and make it full screen. Let's do the graphical install. All right, and yep, we're gonna do English, United States, and American English, the best type of English. All right, and it's detecting my network link so that it can download all the packages that it needs to over the internet. Again, that's the trade-off that you have when you have a much smaller ISO, but I've got a pretty fast internet connection, so shouldn't take too long. All right, and I'll leave the host name as is. Don't need to fill in a domain name. Go ahead and set up your root password. And you can also tick this box to see the passwords in the clear if you're not sure of what it is for some reason, but I would expect everybody to know what their root passwords are. And then enter the name for your regular user that you're going to mostly be logging in as. And then of course a password for the user as well. I'm gonna do Eastern time, that's the default. And 
and we'll do guided use entire disk just to keep things simple and let's do all our files in one partition and let's write the changes to the disk yes All right, and then you have the option of scanning another DVD that has packages on it. Uh, this is pretty much what you would do if, say for example, you didn't actually have an internet connection and you wanted to scan some of these packages and stuff off of there. Um, obviously, I'm not gonna do that, so just leave it as no and hit continue. And, um, oh yeah, so this is to choose your mirror. I'm gonna pick United States, because of course, that's where I'm located at. Uh, but just choose whichever one that's in your country. That way you get the fastest connection possible to the uh, package manager, or from the package manager, rather. And sure, let's just do the Debian one. And I don't need any HTTP proxies. So now it's gonna configure apt which is of course our package manager in debian and all of its derivatives and now it's just installing our software starting with the linux kernel itself and then you have the popularity contest configuration option. This is basically going to send data to the Debian developers about what packages are being used the most on this system. Uh, so you can choose to use this if you want. By default, the option is no, which I'm glad that it's that option by default. A lot of other software companies, when they want to send additional data, they make you do an opt-out instead of an opt-in. Microsoft, I'm talking about you guys. So yeah, I'm glad that they have this. And no, I'm not going to participate in the package usage survey. And now we're at one of the sections that I actually really like. So I think I mentioned it a couple minutes ago where I said you can choose which desktop environment you want to use during the setup. So there's no reason to have a bunch of different ISOs for different desktop environments. Now don't get me wrong, Debian does have different ISOs for different desktop environments if that's your preference. Um, but honestly, I think this is better. I mean, I can't really think of any great reason why you would have all the different ISOs. I guess maybe uh, for a more novice user, it's better for them to see pictures of these different types of desktop environments. I actually wonder if that could somehow be built into um, this setup here where you can actually see the different like a quick layout of what XFCE or KDE Plasma or Cinnamon looks like before you actually click to set it up. But yeah, I wish that Linux Mint would build something like this into it where you can just choose the one that you want it set up. Uh, the first time I think I've seen something like this, well, besides Arch Linux and Gentoo, where you have a nice GUI is Manjaro, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, I would like to see this in more Linux distributions. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick XFCE and I'm going to pick KDE Plasma because these are my two favorite uh, lightweight and bloated desktop environments respectively. And of course, if you are going to be doing something like a server where you're just going to be serving a service, you're not actually going to be uh, using it as a desktop, then you would probably just want to do like an SSH server or a web server. Um, something like that. And also I'm gonna uncheck the print server. I don't even have a printer, so that's just gonna make the setup take a little bit longer. So let's continue. And I'll pause the video while it does this because as you can see, it's got nearly 2000 files that it needs to retrieve. And this is where you can choose your display manager. I'm gonna go ahead and choose light DM. and then it's actually going to install and configure the software. So this should be the part that takes a while. 
All right, and now we want to install the grub bootloader to the master boot record. So leave it as the default option, yes, and hit continue. And then we'll select this as my uh, virtual hard disk. Otherwise, select whichever hard disk you want to install your Debian to. All right, now it's finishing the installation. All right, so now it's time to boot into our new system. All right, so let's log in my username, password, and uh, let's see which default, I mean, which uh, desktop environment is it using? Looks like it's using, um, looks like it's actually using XFCE. I actually want to do KDE first. Um, if it would work, what's going on here? Oh, okay, it was changing my, um, it was just changing my resolution. That's funny, because when I tested this at first, it didn't automatically set my resolution. But I'm glad to see that it's doing it now. All right, there we go. So this is Debian Stable, and there's not really a whole lot of new stuff going on inside of it because it's a little bit far behind the bleeding edge distros like Arch or Gen2 if you're using the AMD64 keyword in your make.conf. That's why uh, if I bring up a terminal, let's see, it's called console, right? And let's make this a little bit bigger. If I do a uname R, you'll see that the kernel version that we're running is 4.19, while the latest kernel is 5.7.5. Now, I can't be too upset at Debian Stable for staying back on this kernel because, well, it's Debian Stable. Kernel version 4.19 has obviously been tested much more thoroughly and by far more people than the latest Linux kernel, but I have to wonder, how much more stable is Debian stable really? I personally haven't had that much trouble on these so-called unstable distros so far, even on Gen 2, where I replaced the OpenSSL libraries with the Libre SSL ones before building all of my packages from source, I'm still able to install most of my packages and use them without any issue. One thing to note about Debian, is that some of the commands and the way you do things are a bit different than what you may be used to. Um, by default, your regular user does not get put in the sudoers file. So if you try to do any command that requires sudo, like sudo apt install htop, it's going to tell us just that, that you're not in the sudoers file, that incident will be reported. So if you actually do want to install anything to your system, at least from the console like this, you have to first become root with the su command. And of course, that's gonna update your environment. That's why the PS1 value here changes. And now you're root, so then you can do apt install htop and then you can actually go ahead and install packages like that. Now, this is just for doing root commands on the terminal though. Uh, if you're a novice user, chances are you are probably more comfortable doing things like installing software through a GUI, um, and that works the same way. So if we choose to install something, um, let's see, it should load soon enough. Okay, there we go. So yeah, as you can see, if you try to install something through the GUI, then you just get this pop-up window to give the password for root. 
and then you can go ahead and install uh, whatever it is. And one other thing that's a little weird about Debian compared to other distros is the commands to shut down and reboot are different than they are on other Linux distros. You can't simply type power off to power off your machine or reboot into the terminal to reboot your machine because these aren't valid commands. To power off or reboot on Debian, you need to prepend systemctl before that command. So like to power off would be systemctl power off and then that's how you actually do it. I don't really know why Debian does this. I don't know what the advantage is to using this syntax over a simple power off or reboot. If you have some insight into this, please let me know in the comments below because it just seems kind of silly that they wouldn't do that. Even if that is the true command to power off or the true command to reboot, why not just alias it to a simple power off or reboot? Um, now let's go ahead and switch to XFCE just to show that you can do that. Uh, we want to log out. Uh, yeah, log out. And then we just wanna click up here and then we'll do XFCE session and then log in with that. And so you can see it's pretty seamless. You can switch DEs fairly easily. So for my overall rating of Debian stable, I think I'm gonna give it a B minus. I understand putting it on a stable release. Maybe that's best in a computer lab environment or maybe a school environment. In fact, I would love to see Debian running at my local library instead of Windows 7, especially since Windows 7 isn't even supported anymore. So it's literally way less secure than having something like Debian run and plus at the library, people are pretty much just typing up documents or going on a web browser. And as I've said time and time again, Linux is more than sufficient for typing up something uh, typing up a document, creating a spreadsheet, going on a browser, like it's got that covered, it's had that covered for years now. Um, I do think that it would be possibly a good idea to add a user to the sudoers file, especially for home desktop users. I mean, you could always have an administrator configure it differently if it's going to be in the library scenario that I mentioned earlier, because Obviously, you don't want your patrons to have root access to the systems there. And they really should build in command aliases. So you don't have to type systemctl power off or systemctl shut down. I think most Linux users are used to a simple power off or shut down command. So if that could also be the case in Debian, I think it would be great. That way everything would just be more uniform in the Linux world. I mean, I get the way that the Linux world is, doesn't necessarily lend itself to being uniform, but things that just seem silly to me, like making the commands to shut down and reboot more verbose just cause, it seems silly. I don't, I can't think of any good reason why it would be done that way. Anyway, that's it for this video, guys. Be sure to like, subscribe, tick that notification bell, and share the video with all your friends as well as your enemies. Bye now.